Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Kevin Hickey. I'm a fellow at um, Berkeley School of Law. And our project looks at copyright law through the lens of paternalism and behavioral law and economics. And uh, it's very much a work in progress, so I'm going to try to be brief because I'm really interested in your question. So I consider the project to have two <coughs> main aims. The first is to explore a tension between Cuckert's dominant incentive model, which presumes that authors are rational actors that respond to economic incentives to create. And a lot of existing, a lot of paternalistic provisions in existing copyright law, which I argue suppose a very different conception of the author, one who cannot uh, look, out at, look out for his own economic interests. The second aim, uh, which is more tentative, kind of explores as a thought experiment what the legal structure of copyright might look like if we took this paternalistic impulse seriously. And so at that part still developing what are the policy and normative implications of this tension between the incentive model, this conception of the author, and the conception of the author in copyright paternalist provisions. So first a bit of background. What do we mean by paternalism? This is actually a really fraught question, but uh, I sort of going back to sort of John Stuart Mill, trying to adopt a very minimalist definition. And uh, as I use in the paper, I mean uh, when the state limits the choices of individuals uh, for their own protection, to protect them from the consequences of their own decisions. And to be clear, I don't mean the word to have any inherently negative connotations as it's sometimes used. I think paternalism as regulation can certainly be invasive. It can also be, you know, a sort of positive and necessary intervention. And the field of behavioral law and economics has really reignited the old debate about the propriety of paternalism as a regulatory, <coughs> uh, regulatory tool. If we think individuals have bounded rationality, bounded willpower, bounded self-interest, does this furnish a basis for the state uh, to limit their decisions or to sort of guide them into better decisions? And there's essentially two schools of thought here. Uh, we have soft paternalism, soft behavior law and economics, which emphasizes the use of changes to decision architecture to sort of nudge people into better decisions. So tools like increased information disclosure, uh, changing systems from opt-in to opt-out, how the decision is framed, all aim to help individuals make quote unquote better decisions. More recently, some scholars have argued that if we take the social science in this area seriously, uh, we actually might want hard paternalistic interventions, which include options like, you know, mandates, taxes, things that fence off individual choice. And their argument is that a lot of these soft paternalistic interventions fail for the very reasons that motivate them. If you think people are boundedly rational, are going to systematically make bad decisions in certain contexts, providing them in, in, like additional information could help, but it might only help a, some, a small subset of them. And it might actually be ineffective you know, because of the limits of rationality that are motivating the regulation in the first instance. So how does this all translate uh, to copyright? Uh, you know, as an initial matter, we might want to think about what the potential behavioral market failures are in copyright law and where they might come into play. So <clears throat> they're divided up into two stages, the creation stage and the assignment stage. The creation stage deals with you know, the decision of an author to engage in artistic creation. Uh, the assignment stage deals with the very common phenomena of where an author signs the rights to an intermediary, such as a publisher or a record company. This is common, there are sound economic reasons for them to do so. And as we'll see, a lot of the paternalistic interventions in copyright are, are aimed at this stage. So at the creation stage, the two big phenomena are uh, the phenomenon of intrinsic motivation, we have an increasing body of evidence suggesting that you know, some individuals, maybe not all individuals, uh, engage in artistic creation, not for the external economic incentive of copyright, but for reasons like self-actualization, challenge, desire, the love of the activity. We also have the problem of judgment under uncertainty. Human beings are really bad at making decisions involving probabilistic outcomes. On the face, copyright um, as an incentive might suffer from some of these problems. It's a relatively indirect incentive. It doesn't guarantee artists any compensation. Instead, that compensation is dependent on the very uncertain prospect of success in the marketplace. 
At the assignment stage, the two big uh, potential failures are that of bonded willpower and social preferences. So people have a taste for immediate gratification uh, and tend to discount, sometimes hyperbolically, uh, future returns. So there's a danger in the interactions between authors and publishers that they're going to assign their way their rights for a small immediate payment and really discount potentially valuable future revenue. People also have social preferences, so contrary to traditional economic theory, they don't prefer allocations of resources that maximize total wealth. They prefer allocations that sort of equalize welfare gains across individuals. So even if we think that the bargaining between authors and publishers is a product of perfectly fair and equal economic bargaining, people might just not like the outcome if it's perceived to be unfair or one-sided. So the main part of the paper is descriptive. It's looking at copyright law's existing provisions, which are, can be best understood as <coughs> motivated by paternalism. So we have things like termination rights, most obviously, which enable authors to rescind you know, ill-considered contracts decades later. Uh, the elimination of formalities protects a careless author from forfeitures of copyright if they don't place notice on the, on the work or uh, fail to register it. We have a series of limitations on copyright alienability. Uh, we have a writing requirement that's fairly strict. Um, the law limits what type of commission works can be designated as made for hire via contract. Um, some courts uh, interpret uh, assignments in future media very strictly. So things like whether an e-book is included in an assignment of rights in book form. We also have moral rights. And uh, you know, a very large part of the piece is devoted to exploring the purposes uh, behind these provisions, looking at what Congress says, looking at what courts say, what's really motivating these provisions. Uh, and I should caveat that it's, the reality is, is, of course, complicated. Copyright lawmaking is characterized by sort of messy uh, compromises and <coughs> multiple factors driving these provisions. But to generalize, I think they are motivated by a vision of authors that systematically lacking the bargaining power of these publishers. And the source of that bargaining power is disputed. Uh, to some degree, it's motivated by a conception of authors as a you know, sort of romantic conception of authors as short-sighted, irresponsible, and pecutious. That conception is certainly invoked. Uh, to some degree, it's motivated by authors simply lacking bargaining power for structural reasons, things like publisher oligopoly, things like the diff difficulty in valuing artistic works prior to their exploitation. In any event, these provisions operate in paternalistic fashion because they limit an author's choices in order for, you know, for their own protection. So some authors might want to assign away termination rights, they might want to designate a work made for hire, and it prohibits them from doing so in exchange for other compensation. So this creates, I think, an important tension between uh, the vision of the author presented in the dominant set of model of copyright and the vision uh, cited in these paternalistic provisions. <coughs> The incentive model supposes that authors are economically rational, or at least that they respond to economic incentives that are relatively distant and uncertain, so they're only going to create new works if we give them broader rights and scope and duration. The paternalistic provisions suppose an author that's quite different, an author that's incapable of uh, protecting their own economic interests, even in a very highly economic contract, context like negotiation of a contract. So if we think that authors are going to make bad deals with publishers because they're neglectful of future revenues, it seems fair to question whether those future revenues were actually the source driving their artistic creation. If we think that authors are not going to comply with formality provisions um, because they're careless, they don't have copyright in mind, then that also questions whether copyright was really the motivation for their creation. So the final part of the piece, and um, one that is still developing, so I'd love your, your feedback on it, tries to tease out the normative and policy implications of the tension between these two visions of authorship. And my inclination here is that our, we kind of have like a hybrid model with these two conceptions of the author, and that at least risks having the costs of both systems without the benefit of either. So by eliminating formalities, we have this relatively expansive default right granted by default to all creators. On the other hand, if you take these paternalistic provisions at face value, they seem to be aimed at sort of a distributive goal, giving authors a larger piece of the pie. And I argue that at least the provisions we have in existing law 
are not very effective at accomplishing this goal. Termination rights are not very valuable to the vast majority of authors whose works aren't uh, economically valuable 35 years later. A lot of the other interventions I would characterize as soft paternalism that tend to fail for the reasons that motivate them. So if we think authors systematically lack bargaining power, a writing requirement might help a bit, but it sort of just means they'll assign away their rights for a pittance as opposed to orally assign away their rights for a pittance. They don't do anything to directly address the bargaining balance uh, that it seems to at least be perceived to exist. So if we're actually taking this seriously, we probably want slightly stronger medicine than we have in our current law. So this is kind of just another way of, of making the same point. If we take the rational model seriously, it's hard to justify these paternalist provisions. You know, if, if you think authors are economically rational, all this does is lessen their bargaining power, gives them less to assign to the publisher. And in particular, it would seem imperative to reduce formalities. The evidence of intrinsic motivation is clear, at least with some significant subset of authors, I would argue. And granting copyright by default to these folks seems to mainly carry social costs without much incentive benefit. On the other hand, if we take this you know, vision of the author as boundedly rational, the sort of uh, conception of the author and the paternalistic provisions of copyright seriously, then what we have is, is not effective, as I mentioned. We might want to consider sort of stronger interventions of all in lines of what they have in Europe. Um, and similar with our incentive structure, on the face of it, seems a bit ill-designed. If we have a boundedly rational author who has boundable power, you know, giving them kind of a lottery ticket to an uncertain future reward might not be the most effective way, or at least it's not the most direct way of encouraging intervention. So we might want to consider um, potential restructuring of the incentive structure. But not only are these thoughts tentative, they're not even meant to be purely normative. I'm trying to examine copyright law sort of from the internal logic, and if we're really serious about the conception of the author that is presented you know, by Congress and courts when they justify these provisions, then that seems to me to at least be a potential consequence. So I have 10 minutes for questions, and I'm excited to get them. So I'm going to start to for the left. Um. I, I wonder how much of this can be described as paternalism and how much is simply market uncertainty uh, and accounting for an unknown future. So some of the things I think could easily be read as, as paternalism in your value neutral sense, like uh, formalities. Uh, others, I think, may be harder to chalk up at least primarily to that. So. Uh, want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, you know, I deal with this a lot. Things like because that's like royalties also would fall into this category of uncertain future, but not necessarily paternalistic. Yeah, so, uh, so I, uh, this is something I deal with a lot in the paper because that's explicitly given as an explanation for termination rights. Um, in that context, I don't necessarily find it persuasive unless there's some sort of information asymmetry. It seems like publishers as well as authors might be subject to uncertainty and valuation prior to exploitation of the work. Authors would probably want to transfer it to publishers who can hold a diverse portfolio. But uh, more directly to your point, I think that regardless of whether it's motivated by kind of a short-sighted author versus just an author who has difficulty valuing the work, it's paternalistic in operation. Because there's at least some authors who want to transfer it. But I agree with you that if it's just if it's strictly uncertainty and valuation and there's no uh, behavioral failures on the part of the author, then there's less tension with the incentive model, right? So, Rebecca? So, um, that's kind of very interesting. So, what, what if it doesn't matter what the law is? And actually, I just finished uh, Abraham Grassmeyer's book and then I read that in combination with Jessica Silby's book and also the book by Laura Murray. And uh, so Grassner makes the excellent point that if all you're about is incentives, there's really just one entity, right? There's no reason to call it patent, trademark, copyright, incentive to do what, right? Uh, we want something, we don't care, you know. So, uh, and then Jessica's book and also the, the other book, which is called Putting Intellectual Property in Place, uh, say, yes, in fact, uh, people have no idea what the law is, they assume a bunch of things about it, and they treat it all as one lump. 
right? Yeah. That's why they always get copyright free American patent wrong, and, and they, they're on to something, because in their minds, they are the same thing. So, mm. it, so let's, what if we took that serious? Um, so one of the things it seems to me would be that you could essentially ignore the creation stage in terms of making authors better off, because it would be hard to do that by working at the creation stage, and you would be pushed into interventions later on. Huh. So, so in this account, it's really like less what you know what the law is than just what people understand the law to be. Yeah, I mean, I think there's got to be an interaction between the two, right? I mean, well, you think that? But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like right. I was saying, yeah. it's an empirical question. Right, and the empirical evidence seems to be no. <laughs> yeah, no. It's it's funny, like how many times I have to like correct friends when they're like, oh, well, like six notes is okay. Right. No, <laughs> I don't know why everyone thinks that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point. And, you know, maybe, and it questions the, 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 this whole sort of enterprise, and probably the enterprise that a lot of us engage in, which is, you know, looking closely, even what courts do, looking closely at congressional history, trying to take purpose, things like this, seriously. Um, you know, maybe I'm just indoctrinated into the law that I think that the law matters, or at least affects people's normative reactions to the law. But I mean, if you really think that and could prove that with the careful evidence, then right, that's, well, this is not so bad. This is your project, right? So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the law matters, right? I don't, I'm not sure if I can engage with the larger proposition of whether the law matters. I'm sort of just going in with that as an assumption to the project. But, um, okay, but actually, I'm so, uh, no, I'm I sorry, don't. I don't want to let you do that. Because <laughs> this project requires you to address behavioral failure, right? Uh, so I think you got it. Yeah, no, I guess, I guess that's interesting. So maybe, I mean, we can broaden this model, right? We can include a number of different, like I just kind of have the, the loan author and the publisher. And like, you're even talking about like, we want the user at least. And there's ways to, and then we, then we have to have a stage, you know, where the law is interpreted. We'd have to talk about agency costs, like you know, how easy is it to get a lawyer who will explain to you the law is. So, it's a good point. Yeah. Um, so you might want to add uh, compulsory remuneration to songwriters under the ASCAP consent decree and performers under webcasting. Um, so that's just you know more examples. Um, yeah, I've been thinking and, about that. And then my question is, how is this different to uh, you know, distributional concerns under copyright, the Molly's paper? Like, is this just the same stuff with a different label, or yeah. is there something different between paternalism and distributive justice? So, I mean, I think it's I think it's different, you know, because I'm, I'm much more focused on the, the process, you know, as well as the results. Um, like, I mean, I think I think social preferences is pretty much just you know distribution, but I think you know things like you know bounded willpower are at least on their face stuff that we could address through you know a lot of different. Means. I'm skeptical how how much like information disclosure or like writing requirements would help, but that could potentially solve a problem like bounded willpower, whereas it couldn't really. Distribution is only concerned with the results and not the process. Is the short answer. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really interesting. And you know, if you want to take a normative approach and say I think paternalism is good, let's write it up. That's a different product. I might agree or disagree. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but what, what you're saying, scriptedly, there is this tension. Let's solve it by changing. And the descriptive part, I, I'm finding it difficult. There is, there is a difference between being irrational and being uninformed. And, and, and most of those tools that you mentioned are very weak default tools. They don't be people, right? They're all designed to share some information, not a lot of information. They're so weak, that, you know, and more right available and would make for hires only about authorships so you can assign whatever you want, which is assignment is not to care about, right? Authorship yeah. is important. But Assignment is where well, the money is. Right. So, yeah. uh, and, and so, uh, termination right or weak? Termination right is maybe the one that I think there is some value to the paternalist approach. But in, in formalities, I don't see the paternalism at all. Because formalities is uh, the idea of formality, I'm limiting my freedom, right? The state comes, you have a choice between A and B, and we don't want you to do one of them. Or you are going to encourage you to do B. I don't think if you come to any uninformed copyright creator and tell him, if you don't write notice, you will lose your copyright. Say, no, no, I want not to. Uh, I mean, I don't see the tension there. So, and they're all, all those documents have non-paternalism explanation to them. Market structure that says, you, if you are poor, I, I, I'm not accepting that you write that, right? I don't think termination rights pass that test. 
But the people who passed their nation right thought that there is a non-paternalistic explanation to that. When the Supreme Court in the 40s says it's paternalistic, that's, that's the end of termination right under the 1909 Act, yeah. right? When, when Frankfurter said, this is paternalism, so I'm going to read it as narrowly as I can, yeah, yeah. termination yeah. right for death, right? Yes. And then in 76, the Congress says, no, 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 we have non-paternalistic explanations. So what I'm saying, I see on the descriptive side at least, a really a, an attempt by Congress to get away from paternalism. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of points there. So on the, the termination right story, there's, there's actually evidence in both camps. It's true that the committee report was often cited less primarily on the uncertain valuation problem, but uh, there there is evidence that sort of invokes, I believe, like it's an impecunious author that makes ill considered decisions. So that's more straightforward. That, that's the language of Frank. That's not the first issue. Frank Frederick said over your responsible post. Yeah. It's not yeah. the, the, the citations are in the paper. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a good point. I mean, I sort of agree with you that a lot of these are fairly weak default rules. And so if you're really serious, that's sort of my point. If you're really serious about it, we probably want something stronger than these weak default rules. I would characterize the elimin I would still I would push back against your description of the elimination of formalities as not being paternalistic. Um, I guess it sort of depends on what the baseline is, right? Like if you have a natural conception of copyright, you're gonna get it by default and there's nothing paternalistic. Whereas if you have a more statutory conception of copyright, then it seems reasonable to expect you to it, but it I understand it doesn't limit your contractual freedom in quite the same way, but it does rely on a conception of authors as kind of careless or at least right. So I agree with the elimination of formalities uh, looks like paternalism, but I think you have to be careful to, and you have to keep an eye on the, um, the context of that time and the fact that we had, as, as Nimmer puts in the industry, weather eye on the Berne Convention. Yeah. So it may be paternalism, but it also might be people wanted to get want to join the international conventions. I think that's totally yeah. right. I actually look at the purpose of what drove okay. the Berra Convention. And I think the moral rights is actually a really tricky uh, issue for you because Berra allows for waiver. It does not allow for transfer. And that actually quite cuts the opposite direction. It, does, it actually quite hurts authors. And can you talk to Bobby Paul about this? Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I wanted to complete the draft before talking to Bobby Paul, but I'm actually considering replacing moral rights with compulsory licenses, and that would kind of move the issue, because the way of ability makes it harder. I think you need to deal with moral rights, I mean, with Vera, but I don't know that it helps you on the paternalism point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also kind of paternalistic towards users, but I think that's like a different paper. But anyway, we'll talk after this. Thanks, everyone.